Hi all, it's Les Posen here, Fear of Flying Clinical Psychologist. Welcome, it's the end of November. A few weeks ago I recorded a uh, video where I want to introduce you to some of the core ideas behind the main intervention that I use and the intervention that's got its, the most runs on the board, that is the most evidence-based published results when it comes to working with anxiety and that's cognitive behavior therapy. It comes in a variety of flavors, but in general, the concept I was trying to get across to you was this one, that you go into Ikea and you see a lovely set of shelves and what you'd like to do is build that. Why have that in your home? Of course, you go down to the Ikea delivery bay and you get a whole set of flat packs with all the elements inside, the wood and the tools and the screws and the dowels, and whatever else. And your task is to interpret this diagram in the hope that you can put it together. And what I was trying to say is that CBT is a little bit like this, where we kind of try and find out what's the finished product that you're after, what's it going to look like, what are the components that need to come together for you to get to that goal of a, a finished product, and also, can you read the signs? The sign here being, can you see the various components and how they fit together? So you end up with a, a nice looking finished product like this. It's possible that you'll also buy a, an external tool in addition to the one that comes from Ikea, like a power drill or a power screwdriver that saves a lot of energy. And then you'll put it away until perhaps the next time you purchase another product from Ikea. This time it's going to be a table or whatever it might be. But this time you won't be as intimidated. You'll know what to expect. It's going to come in a flat back. You're going to get an illustration that looks something like this. And you'll know how to read it. You'll know how to put it together. Yes, you may ask a friend to come up because maybe it's, this time it's a very big task. But it won't in, in, endanger you as much as before. You'll know what you're doing. So CBT is a bit like this in the, in the sense that it, it's a skill developing approach to anxiety and allows you to have some tools which you may continue to use or you may put to one side and then return to it again. It's a very useful set of tools. In the next two sessions today and the next time, I'm going to introduce you to some of the origins of cognitive behavior therapy so that you kind of know where it's coming from. This is particularly important if you're going to actually go off and see somebody who is going to offer you what they call cognitive behavior therapy. And so I want you to know what you're in for and to know the right questions to ask of them to see if this is the right person for you. Welcome to Melbourne, by the way. Did you like my, uh, my New York inspired background? It comes from a company called Black Cat, which does interior design work. This is one of their designs, but I'm actually here in Melbourne. By the way, uh, Melbourne today recorded 30 days straight of no COVID new diagnoses nor deaths. 30 days straight. America, this is what you have to aim for. 30 days straight. Then you can say you're COVID free for the moment. We're about to introduce uh, new systems to allow international tourists to come back into Australia. They will quarantine under very strict conditions for 14 days, and then they're free to go into the community once they've tested to be neutral or, or without uh, any COVID. In America, I'm sorry, you're just gonna have to lock down. You're just gonna have to do this. That's what we did. Melbourne, where I live, uh, had probably the strictest restrictions on a city of five million people that you're going to see. And here we are, several months later, yes, it took that long, and we are essentially free of COVID at the, at the moment, okay? Sorry, that's the way it is. So, oh, that means, I can tell you, I almost forgot, I can tell you that next week on Tuesday, December the 1, December 1, for some of you, this is ahead of time, for some of you, it's, it's, it's well past, I'm taking my first flight with, um, with Jetstar down to Hobart, over water, it's about an hour's flight. Uh, wheels up, wheels down is about 55 minutes, but about an hour and 20 altogether. And uh, I haven't flown since uh, late March. 
so this will be my first flight and then I'm flying again down to Hobart a few days later with a patient for the first time I'm seeing a patient actually in the flesh rather than over zoom and we're going to do the same thing down to Hobart and then the following week I'm flying up to Sydney just to see what it's like I need to have the experience just to get my my uh, my wings up in the air again now let's talk a little bit about uh, about CBT and um, I want to introduce you to the two people who are perhaps most aligned or most thought about by people in my profession when it comes to to CBT. These two people, one dead, one still alive in his uh, late 90s. And I have had the chance to meet both of these people and attended, attended training with them, would you believe, and workshops and things. Interesting. Um, when, when psychologists are surveyed about who are the most, uh, who are the top five psychologists that you think about, uh, these two men uh, are the ones always mentioned in the top five. So let's have a look who they are. And I'm going to get myself uh, out the way, put myself down the bottom corner so you can see. And this is a picture taken by a psychologist called Michael Fenical. Fenical at the American Psychological Association meeting in, in 2002. I think I attended that. I think it was in Chicago. On the left is a guy called Aaron Beck, Tim Beck. On the right is a guy called Albert Ellis. Ellis is, is, has passed. He passed, I think, in 2007. Uh, Tim Beck is still alive in Phil Philadelphia. Every so often does a Skype call into the American Psychological Association. He's still actively writing. And both of these men uh, are considered to be the, the fathers of cognitive behavior therapy. Both of them had come from a psychoanalytic tradition, which was the dominant tradition of uh, psychotherapeutic practice from the time of Freud all the way into the 50s. And both of them expressed dissatisfaction at some point in their careers that this really didn't match the experience that they were seeing when they were working with patients. Uh, Beck was a psychiatrist, or he's a psychiatrist, uh, Ellis, uh, a clinical psychologist. Uh, I'll talk about Ellis's book first because I was first introduced to psychotherapy as a, as a practitioner in the early 80s. Um, and the first book that I recall being referred to was this one called Reason and Emotion in Psychotherapy. The word cognitive behavior therapy isn't even mentioned. But there's a distinction between reason and emotion. Okay, this is the, the thinking. This is published in 1962 and, and is considered the first major work that Ellis published. Later on, when I began my, uh, my formal training, the, the ref, one of the reference books that I was given to, to learn was this one by Ellis and Harper called A New Guide to Rational uh, Living. And this became the uh, the Bible for me uh, in my early days of being a, 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 a psychologist before I even became a, a clinical psychologist. Uh, in terms of Beck, uh, one of the most popular books of Beck's, this is the one written by his daughter, clinical psychologist Judith Beck. I also had a chance to meet her when I was in New Orleans. Um, Cognitive Behaviour Therapy, Basics and Beyond, one of the most uh, in, one of the most uh, frequently referenced and, and used books by, by therapists. And more, more, more recently, and one that's available for the general public to use, and you can go and have a look at this, is a book by David Burns, also a psychiatrist. This book is a follow-up to one of the most popular books written um, following the work of Beck called uh, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And this is the recent follow-up that David Burns has made called Feeling Great. Uh, revolutionary new treatment? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think there's anything new here. I've got the book. I don't think there's anything new here. Nothing revolutionary. It's just... So I want to um, take you through some of the ideas that differentiate uh, these two giants of, of psychotherapy. Oh, by the way, there's one more person I want to introduce you to. Some people uh, think he's not really uh, uh, philosophically in the same league as, as Ellis or Beck. Uh, and his uh, approach is more technique or skill oriented. And that's this man, Don Meikenbaum, uh, originally from Canada and now um, retired in, uh, in Florida. And um, 
one of the most influential people as well. I did get the chance to meet him too when I was in Hamburg at a, at a conference and he was giving a, a workshop. Very impressive man, lots of ideas, uh, especially around post-traumatic stress and very influential too. But some people would say not in the, quite in the same league as Alice and Beck. Let me quickly go through the differences between Alice and Beck because they are significant. Alice in 62 published this list of what he called irrational beliefs. These are ideas that if you hold on to them strongly, you'll make your life miserable. And he wanted to suggest that the job of the psychotherapist, of the psychologist or psychiatrist, was to help you challenge, identify and help you challenge some of these what, what are called core beliefs that give rise to automatic self-talk which you don't challenge, but can be shown to lead you to being miserable, to avoid doing certain things or to overdo certain other things. And he lists 12, 11 of these irrational beliefs. And he stayed pretty steadfast all through his life, Alice, to, to these 11 irrational beliefs. So they continuously um, published in a variety of books that he has written and others who follow rational motive therapy have written too. By the way, rational motive therapy made a change to its name uh, about two decades ago into rational motive behavior therapy. Alice himself was very behavioral, or getting people to go out and do things, uh, test things out. He called these things risk-taking or shame-attacking exercises. And if you were if you were going through the training course as I did in, in RET or REBT as it became. You are required to go out and do things to bring on that we could call risk taking, not putting your life in danger, but risking people looking at you strangely or what's going on here with him. He looks a bit odd. Um, these are risk taking, shame attacking activities. Uh, there are these 11 irrational beliefs. Unfortunately, the term irrational has taken on new meaning uh, as time has gone on, quite different than, than the meaning that, that uh, Ellis perhaps originally attended that to to differentiate rational testable evidence based from irrational which is more emotion based quick not much evidence to them and worthy of challenge and nowadays irrational simply has been used to say you're crazy you're nuts you're neurotic you're high maintenance so it's kind of lost its um, its original meaning that Ellis had there are 11 core beliefs these are core beliefs, so they are held for very long and deep amounts of time, so to speak. Let's go through, and they're, they're basically, it's basically a philosophy, uh, much of which came from uh, Alice's understanding of, of the, the early Greek philosophers, especially the Stoics. Uh, it's a dire necessity for, adult, for an adult human being to be loved and approved by virtually every significant other person in his community. In other words, if I do something that might produce disapproval from someone I better avoid doing that that would be terrible to be disapproved of second one should be thoroughly competent adequate and achieving in all possible respects if one is to be considered worthwhile so he brought out this concept of what's the meaning of self-worth and self-esteem and so forth uh, and the demands we place on ourselves to be certain types of people okay so one of the big core attitudes that REBT wants to bring are notions of self-acceptance and self-compassion. That doesn't mean you're not willing to change. It just accepts that as a human being, I have foibles, I have errors in the coding that I come with, uh, and I have to work with these particular uh, shortcomings, shall we put, shall we put it. And work to excel beyond those things. Um, what else have we got? Human happiness is externally caused. People have little or no ability to control their, their sorrows and disturbances. That's number five. You made me so angry. You made me so unhappy. As compared to, you know, the more I think about this, the more unhappy I make myself. That kind of thing. Uh, what else is there? Number seven, for instance, it's easier to avoid than face certain life difficulties and self responsibilities. Procrastination, avoidance, the fear of flying could be seen here as well. Uh, so these are the 11 of Alice and they keep on being reproduced in slightly different variations in lots of books about this. So it's more an overarching philosophy. And as a psychologist, listening to someone tell their story, 
uh, you're trying to listen for these variations on these 11 core beliefs. And people will often say, I must, she must, I have to, you should. Very, very sort of unconditional kind of beliefs that it's always got to be this way. People should never do this to me. Yeah. So that's what we're listening for, these sort of very hard and fast black and white style of thoughts, uh, which if you hold on to them really tight, you'll end up making yourself miserable. Uh, if we change and we have a look at how Beck goes about it, Beck doesn't really push a very strong philosophical thing, but he's more interested in what's called errors of thinking or cognitive distortions. From Pinterest comes uh, this particular list of them. And again, they will be reproduced over and over again in various books uh, that look more to cognitive therapy in the form that Beck had done it. Um, all or nothing thinking. This will always be this way. It's never like this. Uh, jumping to conclusions. Something happens once. It's always going to be like this. In fear of flying. I had this terrible flight to Singapore. I'm really living in fear that's going to happen again. Up to a certain point, a reasonable apprehension, but it shouldn't stop you from going. But this is the jump to conclusion because it's Singapore, it's going to be terrible. Because the last time I flew into Los Angeles, it was really bad and rough weather. It's going to be the same thing this time. So rather than seeing events as independent, one event almost causes another. You can see other ones, um, shoulds and musts, magnifications, disqualifying the positive, only seeing something negative and not seeing that there's a possibility that there's a positive as well. So this is not necessarily a, a core philosophy. It's more the task of the therapist here to help someone challenge or reappraise some of their cognitive distortions and point out that there may be other ways to contemplate how the same situation uh, could be assessed. So two quite different people in the, in the Ellis camp tend to see its approach as being an elegant approach because it's all encompassing rather than saying, oh, I think you might be wrong in your thinking. It says, well, let's imagine you are wrong or you are right, whichever. Let's just imagine, you know, you will have a terrible time going into, into Los Angeles again. Let's just imagine that the weather really is bad like it was that first time. And therefore, and so, so it posits that rather than trying to get you to shift ideas that, well, it, it really might not happen again. So let's not worry too much. It says, well, let's imagine it will happen again. What's the worst that's going to happen if it happens again? You can see quite a different philosophical approach. Okay, That's my reading of it. So when you go and see somebody who says, I practice cognitive behavior therapy, you can ask them, well, what's your background? How do you work? Are you more REBT? Are you cognitive therapy? Are you more Mikenbaum? Let me show you that the, there's a lovely slide here uh, that compares the... Um, these three approaches, REBT of Alice, Cognitive Therapy of Beck, and CBM, which is Cognitive Behavior Modification of Meikenbaum. So you can see uh, the, the various differences. I'll leave it out here for a while. You can always just stop the video and just come back and have a, a look at this. Uh, what's really important of all of these, and this is where we're going to go next time after this video. I'm going to show you another video, which is how I contemporarily practice. One of the challenges I've always had with, with uh, the cognitive approach of Beck, I see lots of people coming to see me who've, who've done, gone through this approach. They do really well in the therapy room. They're really good at pushing back against the ideas, identifying erroneous beliefs, challenging their assumptions, and then when they get on the plane, it all goes out the window. And that's because we have to do more than simply cognitively change the way we think. We've got to put that change of thinking together with a change of behavior. Okay, we're going to look next time in another video at some of the work which uh, an Australian clinical psychologist called Michelle Kraske has done and whose work I admire greatly and looking at things like something called habituation and something called inhibitory learning. What's the new learning that you have to actually physically do? Not just the cognitive, changing your thinking. You have to convert that thinking into new behaviors that ultimately will push the old behaviors into what we might call dormancy. They're still there, ready to go if, you, if the situation calls for it. But you want to start to practice new behaviors. Think of it this way. 
you're driving a lovely little Kia 95 horsepower car, you come into a vast amount of money and you buy yourself a Porsche Turbo 935 or 911, whatever it might be, very different car, engines at the back, 600 horsepower, yes, you know how to drive a car, accelerator and brake and turn the, turn the wheel, but you cannot simply use the same skill set you develop driving a Kia to drive that Porsche, especially in difficult driving conditions, wet roads, you'll get yourself killed. You have to new, learn new skills of driving a car, even though you've got the basic skills there. So that's what we're talking about. We have to take a change in the way you think and actually practice how to do it. And if you're lucky, you buy yourself a really high powered Porsche or, or BMW or something, you'll, you'll get a free set of lessons to go out onto a race car track and really put yourself through the through the motion. So you really learn how to handle this car rather than assuming, oh, I know how to drive a car. What, what's so different? Okay, that's the difference. All right, so that's what I'm going to come back with in another video in, uh, in a little while. The work of Michelle Kraske and, uh, and her colleagues like David Barlow. It should be a fun time because this will get you started because I'm going to get you to follow certain things to do uh, before you do your flight or you visit a, a tall building or you go into the public or you give a speech, whatever it might be. Same kind of principles involved. So come back to that. Keep subscribe, why don't you? So that you don't miss out on one of my videos. And uh, if you need to write, write me questions, put it in the comments down below. Um, and uh, I'll just make myself a bit bigger so that you can, you can see me there, back in Melbourne, um, so that uh, I can respond to you, okay? So see you again in December, I hope. Bye for now.